Many people these days are used to the storytelling and vibe of the Bethesda Fallout games. Bethesda has had what I call the Netflix effect on the Fallout series. While this is not always a bad thing, it goes without saying that Bethesda has, in a sense, bubblegummed the franchise. Bethesda was not the first to receive this feedback, though. Black Isle and Interplay were given the same feedback after the release of Fallout 2, with many critics targeting the outrageous humor and extremely time-specific pop culture references. Fallout 2 was still met with favorable reviews, as are the Bethesda games for the most part. Still, many fans have felt the absence of the dark atmosphere that inhabited the first game. While Fallout 2 offered an incredible array of gameplay and quality of life improvements, it wasn't saved from negative criticism. Many chastised the developers for not building enough on the previous title, and people were beginning to find the graphics worn. Many titles around Fallout 2's release were considered to be much better looking. The second entry in the Fallout series would still please fans and critics alike for its gripping story and memorable characters, regardless of the change in atmosphere. What was offered in the original Fallout was a bleak and dreary take on what life post-nuclear would look like. Fallout 2 showed life and civilization much later in the timeline, with the events of Fallout taking place in the year 2161 and Fallout 2 jumping to 2241, an 80-year gap. This could be why we see such a light-hearted and humorous take on the wasteland in Fallout 2. Society may have just become more accustomed to the new world life. Or the devs just liked memes more. What the frick are you guys doing? So what made Fallout so different from its successors? This bleak, dark, dreary atmosphere that I'm referring to. Well, it starts from the beginning. Fallout opens with something most fans are used to at this point. Distorted pre-war music begins to play. And this time it's maybe by the ink spots. Strangely, Interplay originally wanted to use I Don't Want to Set the World on Fire by the same group. Still, for whatever reason at the time, Interplay was unable to get the license. Maybe was obtained, and the rest is history. We would hear I Don't Want to Set the World on Fire later in the series as the introduction song for Fallout 3. These haunting old world tunes act as a juxtaposition to the horror slowly becoming visible to the player. We see vault tech propaganda followed by more government propaganda from the United States. And commercials flash on the screen as we pan out to reveal the decimated remains of post-war America. This is the first time we see the Fallout Wasteland, and there is nothing funny or lighthearted about it. Clearly, tragedy has struck. Buildings are mere shells of their former structures, the sky is bleak, the land is barren, and then we hear Ron Perlman's narration welcoming us to the series. War. War never changes. The Romans waged war to gather slaves and wealth. Spain built an empire from its lust for gold and territory. Hitler shaped a battered Germany into an economic superpower. But war never changes. In the 21st century, war was still waged over the resources that could be acquired. Only this time, the spoils of war were also its weapons petroleum and uranium. For these resources, China would invade Alaska, the US would annex Canada, and the European Commonwealth would dissolve into quarreling, bickering nation states bent on controlling the last remaining resources on Earth. In 2077, the storm of World War had come again. In two brief hours, most of the planet was reduced to cinders. And from the ashes of nuclear devastation, a new civilization would struggle to arise. A few were able to reach the relative safety of the large underground vaults. Your family was part of that group that entered Vault 13. Imprisoned safely behind the large vault door under a mountain of stone, a generation has lived without knowledge of the outside world. Life in the vault is about to change. The message seems hopeless. War never changes. In that rubble of the pre-war, we are introduced to the underground vaults that house some of the last remaining hope for humanity this new world has. Much like most things in the wasteland, these vaults are too good to be true. While some function the way the dwellers expect them to, many are social experiments brought forth by the creator of the vaults, vault Tech, and the shadow government of the United States, the Enclave. These things aren't explored in the first entry of Fallout, too much. It could be that the developers were trying to set a foundation before introducing such a massive backstory, or they hadn't explored the lore themselves. Whatever reason, we are kept in the dark about much of vault Tech and their nefarious experiments in the first entry of the series. Something that I consider to be some of the bleakest stories in the series. 
Fallout manages to secure its bleakness with the settlements you visit in-game. Leaving Vault 13 and entering the unknown for the first time is undoubtedly a daunting task. Emerging from the cave and seeing natural light for the first time is sure to be a tremendous life experience for anyone. Marked with only the location of Vault 15, another nearby vault -Tec vault, the Vault Dweller begins their journey into the Waste, running directly in to Shady Sands. Shady Sands is a small farming community doing their best to get by, and we see the bleakness of this universe here in spades. The town is plagued by ignorance, which is leading their crops to wilt. This coupled with the various Rad Scorpion and Raider attacks, it's a harsh living indeed. Yet, much like most of the Wasteland, the people carry on, and in later entries we see that Shady Sands becomes one of the most potent factions in the desert, annexing many territories and spreading their law and order wherever they may find themselves. Still. We see the bleak beginnings of this mighty faction in Trading Town. This hopeless feeling follows us everywhere we go in Fallout. From the larger settlement areas like Aditum in the Boneyard, formerly Los Angeles, to the other smaller settlements like Junktown, people are still just barely getting by. The most well-off still scrape by for survival. Cities like the Hub, which stretch for miles and miles, still hold the universal tone of bleakness. Sure, many people find work guarding in caravans or helping the local law with the scum around town, but the scum often wins in Fallout. In fact, Gizmo at Junktown, a pseudo-mob type who lords over the village by peddling addiction and gambling, turns out to be the better option for the future of the town than the self-appointed town sheriff, Killian. Something that the game would lead you to believe would not be the case. These types of endings really define the first entry of the Fallout series and lead us to the main reason Fallout is so bleak. The story follows the Vault Dweller of Vault 13 across the wasteland. A nuclear war has wiped out most of society on October 23rd, 2077. 84 years after the Great War, in 2161, Vault 13's water purification chip begins to malfunction. This is a computer chip used in vault Tech vaults that regulates the pumping and recycling of drinking water to the vault. The Vault Dweller is tasked with finding a replacement by the Overseer of Vault 13. They would not be the first person to be sent out to look for this chip, and odds are, they wouldn't be the last if they were not successful. This really starts to set the tone of the original Fallout experience. This world, this universe that you're being thrust into, it would continue without you. Your quest is so small compared to the plight of the Wasteland, which begins to unfold as you explore the ravaged West Coast remains of post-war America. The cards seem constantly stacked against you, and the hopelessness is real. The Vault has some records of water chips that may be out there, but beyond that, there's no way Vault 13 can prepare the Vault Dweller for what they will experience in the Waste. Blissfully unaware of the bleak outcome that is inevitable in the Wasteland, the Vault Dweller begins to search for the replacement chip. Each stop on the way reminds us of the hellscape the world has become. The inhabitants of the Wasteland have their own hardships, some vastly outtrumping a simple shortage of drinking water. Even temporary solutions seem to have a bleak, unforeseen outcome. Arriving at the hub, the Vault Dweller can find a glimmer of hope when conversing with the water merchants in the area. With enough caps, they can secure a shipment of some drinking water to the Vault. This calls more attention to Vault 13's location, though, and the consequences can be quite grave. Eventually, the Vault Dweller will discover a replacement chip. Even this is filled with bleak choices with significant consequences. Under the town of Necropolis lies Vault 12. This vault was one of the first introductions to Vault Tech's evil ways that we see in the series. The door of Vault 12 was designed not to seal correctly, and allow radiation to flood the vault. This was done to study the effects that radiation would have on the population. The result would be some of the first ghouls that would emerge in the Fallout timeline. Necropolis, as it stands in 2161, is a dreadful place. Super mutants created by the Master have taken over parts of the town, precisely where the water pump is. The water pump is broken, and the ghouls that call this place home have been using the water chip in Vault 12 as a steady source of water. This poses a few problems. The Vault Dweller, in theory, could just go grab the water chip from Vault 12, thus ending their quest and returning to Vault 13 to save their friends and family. This, of course, would not leave the ghouls of Necropolis in an excellent position. They will surely die without water being available in the city. Finding the right parts of the water pump, one could fix it and get permission from the ghouls to take the water chip. An outcome that can lead to some bleak happenings, but is undoubtedly the more humane way to go. What route do you choose for this though? The super mutants that have gathered nearby do not have the perception or intelligence to tell you apart from an average ghoul who the mutants allow to live out a frightened existence as they seem to feel a bit of kinship with them. With the mutants being of a little problem, the choice is really up to the vault dweller. Put in the extra work and help Necropolis with the water source, or simply steal the chip 
and think solely of your own home. If one was to take a look at the various social norms in the Fallout universe, the latter doesn't seem that far off. Many humans do not consider ghouls, even non-ferals, to be anything but subhuman. With that mindset, it's easy to believe that one could just take the water chip without losing any sleep from it. Let's go into what happens when you bring it back to the vault. Of course, there are new problems. Well, they aren't exactly new, but problems nonetheless. The super mutants that have been harassing towns and caravans alike are showing up more and more in the wasteland. The overseer is confident that they are being created somewhere. Even after you have saved your vault, the bleakness of this world shows through even more. The mutants will more than certainly find their way to Vault 13 as they continue their search for pure humans to go into the FEV vats. FEV, or the forced evolutionary virus, is the dominant factor in the creation of these mutants. The overseer needs you to shut it down by any means necessary. The mutant leader, the master, needs to be stopped as well. So the vault dweller is thrust back into the wasteland for another surmountable journey. The super mutants are beginning to overrun the waste and people are getting kidnapped and turned into these monsters more and more each day. As the number of these mutants grow, militants protecting communities are having a harder and harder time keeping them at bay. They have to be stopped. It turns out the mutants are coming from an old military base, Mariposa. High-ranking and intelligent members of the mutant army inhabit this base. The number of super mutants is absolute as the vats here are creating them. Being a pure human, pretty much clean of radiation due to the protection of Vault 13, the Vault Dweller is a prime candidate for the VATS treatment. Eventually, the Dweller will initiate a self-destruct sequence from the central computers on the base, narrowly escaping the giant blast and destroying the source of the super mutants. That just leaves the Master, the leader of the super mutant army. His plan is to change all of the humans into super mutants using the FEV he had stored in the VATS. His reasoning behind this is as bleak as the universe itself. Turning everyone into super mutants would eliminate the differences in mankind that caused the world to be cast in fire. The Master hopes by executing his plan, it would prevent something like that happening in the future. Not to mention, he has some pretty warped ideas about superior races and whatnot. The Vault Dweller is forced to act here, either talking the Master down by exposing holes in his plan, or to fight him to the death. The warhead stored under the cathedral, along with this demo vault the Master has taken up refuge in, must be destroyed. Talking to the Master can persuade him to blow the whole place sky high due to the follies of his plans, but if not, hacking the computer for the warhead is pretty much mandatory. Again, the Dweller manages to escape the giant nuclear blast that destroys the cathedral and the Master along with it. Fallout isn't done with the bleakness yet. We still have to travel back to Vault 13 to report to the Overseer that the biggest threats to the Vault, and thus humanity, have been destroyed. The majority of the mutants that were a part of the Master Army will die out, either by force or just due to lack of direction, ending up wandering aimlessly until death takes hold. Some, the ones that kept their basic intelligence, will find new paths in life, abandoning the Master's plan and finding new purpose in the Wastes. Returning to Vault 13, we see the culmination of this bleak story, and finally come to what makes Fallout far more desolate than its predecessors. Returning to Vault 13, we meet the Overseer at the door. You've done it. That's wonderful, amazing. I'm so proud of what you've accomplished, what you've endured. There's no way the people of the Vault can ever thank you enough for what you've done. You've saved all our lives. Who knows? Maybe even save the human race. <sighs> yes. That makes the rest of this even harder. Everyone will want to talk to you. Every youngster will look up to you and want to emulate you. And then what? They'll want to leave. What happens to the vault if we lose the best of a generation? What if we are the only safe place in the world? You just gave us back all these lives. I can't take the chance of losing them. I've made a lot of tough decisions since I took this position, but none of them harder than this one. You saved us, but you'll kill us. I'm sorry. You're a hero. And you have to leave. That's right. After all the sacrifices made by the Vault Dweller, the Overseer has decided that it's far too dangerous for them to return to the Vault. Jacqueline recognizes that the Dweller is a hero, but demands that they leave the Vault. 
With the bloody mess perk, the Dweller will then blast the Overseer in half with an incredible and unique critical shot. Without the perk, the Vault Dweller leaves, with their head hung low, walking back into the wastes that have, at this point, shaped them more into the person they are now than the Vault ever did. The Vault Dweller would go on to found the town of Arroyo, setting the events of Fallout 2 into motion. The ending of Fallout here, though, is quite glum. Even when you win, you lose here. The Vault Dweller sacrifice their very humanity and everything they know to complete their quest, only to be met with coldness, to be sent back out into the wastes over and over again, only to be told never to come back. When I played Fallout back in the 90s, it was my first experience with a game that had the kind of weight to it. To this day, I struggle to find a game that is as bleak as Fallout. Sure, there are some contenders, but I always remember the hopelessness feeling that I felt when playing through this game. The ending, being cast back out into the waste and that's it, roll credits. There was no, let's play the game after the ending, post ending thing. That was how the story ends. Your head hung low, casting a creeping shadow in the desert. Future unknown, and the feeling of betrayal in your heart. Thanks for watching my video about how bleak the first Fallout is, one of the darkest tiles I have ever played. If you liked what you saw, consider dropping a thumbs up on the videos, it helps the channel out a lot. And think about subscribing if you want to see more videos like this. I want to thank my patrons and YouTube channel members, your continued support helps out a lot. And I want to give a special thanks to my biggest supporters, Kim Jong-un, Popo Hum, your typical redneck, and Fireflare. You guys are amazing and I'm grateful as hell for all the support. Thanks again guys, I'll catch you on the next one. It has been Mantis. Uh, I gotta testify. Come up in the spot looking extra fly For the day you die You gon' trust the sky You gon' trust the sky, baby girl Testify Come up in the spot looking extra fly For the day you die